he recognized over and over where he made a mistake. And I think that was that's a power that most of us do not have. And he also had that ability to recognize the, the power of other people and where they surpassed him in something and to help channel their ability into the same mission that he had. Well, I'm, I'm very honored because I have been a big fan of your work for a long time. And I wanted to ask, what, what was it like spending the pandemic in, in Cambodia and Mongolia? It must have been uh, a different experience than the rest of us. No, for me, it was all in, in, Mon- all in Cambodia. I left oh. Mongolia. Mongolia closed down in January 2020. And I didn't really open back up until uh, April of 2021. So, I mean, of 22, 2022. So it was a long term. So I stayed in Cambodia. I thought, okay, I'll go there for three months and the COVID will pass and I'll return to Mongolia. Well, it's been two years. <laughs> And so we, wow. Actually, it's been fine in Mongolia. I, I mean, it's fine in Cambodia. I think it's been uh, quite mild here compared to other places in the world. We were a little bit late to get the vaccines, but we got them. And and you retired there basically after after your academic and publishing career. Uh, no, my life really is in Mongolia. My home is in Mongolia, and uh, I left with my daughter, thinking I was going to go to the U.S. for a short visit. And then I got waylaid and uh, I decided I'm not going to America. I'll just go and wait out the COVID situation in Cambodia. And actually, it was a good choice. Uh, everybody else has been very worried about me, of course, being here. But it was a good choice. And uh, the government, I think, did a good job of controlling the situation and getting vaccines to people. We yeah. Were, we were you know, we were told what to do. It's not the same as in some countries where you have all these choices of different vaccines and all. We didn't have a lot of choice. And we started with Sinovac, the first couple with Sinovac, and then moved to AstraZeneca, and then they gave us uh, Pfizer. So we had four. Wow. Well, I, you know, I, I, I still have my copy of, of Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World, which has got to be... 15 years old now. I, I bought. I know I bought this at the Borders in uh, Union Square in New York City, and it it was just such a fascinating, incredible book because, you know, you take this mostly reviled historical figure or poorly understood historical figure, and you really figure out what makes him tick. Uh, and I just I loved the book so much. Well, I appreciate that, and I really do. And- uh, you have been a, a great blessing to authors everywhere. You yourself have written so many outstanding books, but you promote everybody. Not, <laughs> and, and that's, I think, unusual among authors. We tend to promote ourselves and not everybody. And you really give us all a big boost. And you help a lot of people who are aspiring to be authors. I see the work that you've done. Wow, that that means a lot. Yeah, I mean, to me, the idea, uh, like, authors are not in competition with each other. We're in competition with people not reading. So I I feel like I want them to read, period. Yes, yes. And I I don't know a better spokesperson for getting people reading and writing. You're also pushing that. Well, thank you. So as you sat down to uh, tackle Genghis Khan all these years ago, what did you feel like, why did you feel compelled to do that? Some people might go like, why do you, like, uh, I, I mean, some people compare him to Hitler. It's like, why would you write a, why would you write a book about the, the genius of Hitler, right? Like, wh- yeah. why sitting down and writing about this figure that uh, so many people have not only not studied, but feel like people shouldn't study? Yeah. Well, I lived many years in Germany. I went to the university there, and I sort of have a sense of how people feel about Hitler, and that's very yeah. negative. But when I went to Mongolia, I realized that the people there love him, honor him, worship him. He is a tremendous influence in daily life in Mongolia. And I had to think about my own perceptions then. Okay, then why do we see it this way and they see it that way? How can they be such opposite perspectives? And I was a little bit slow to change my perspective. And I really did not set out to write a biography of anybody, much less of him, because I'm 
it was such a strange, different world for me. But I wanted to write about uh, trade. I wanted to write about the Silk Route and what was happening there. And the more time I spent in the whole Silk Route, I realized his importance in that history. And then slowly I began. And then Mongolian friends, it really was scholars and friends, that began to tell me, you should write the biography. I said, well, no, I can't write the biography. So, but you're an American. You can speak to people we can't speak to. You can speak in English. And finally, I was somehow to said, yes, I'm going to do it. I may not be an expert, but I'm going to do it. And, and as I understand it, in Mongolia, when it was part of Soviet Russia, the history of uh, Genghis Khan was deliberately suppressed. So, so people don't know about it, not just because it's controversial, but people didn't know about it because it, they were not allowed to know about it for a very long time. Absolutely correct. It was forbidden. Uh, the descendants who could be found of him uh, were killed. Almost all of them were killed. Very few escaped from that. And almost every mention of him was banned. Uh, it was a, a, a terrible repression for the people of Mongolia. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's somewhat ironic given one of the things I most admired about Genghis in the book, which was his uh, openness to ideas. Right. And his love of the scholarly tradition, there there is some irony that this great conqueror who people thought was uh, what sort of uh, pro censorship and re- suppression uh, would himself then later be the country he founded would, and, and territory he conquered would itself be conquered. And he be the one that is suppressed and uh, and and covered over. Yes. Yeah. History so full of irony like that. Uh, and that, that certainly worked for him. But I, I just wanted to look at the other side of the story, examine the other side, and try to make it known. And readers are smart enough to choose for themselves the right path and the truth. And they base it on their own experience, their own knowledge. They go forward. I'm just saying this is what I think. This is what I believe. This is my research. And then leave it to the people to decide for themselves. Back in the ancient world, philosophy wasn't abstract, it wasn't theoretical, it was designed to help you live the best life. In Stoicism 101, we have a two-week course that will introduce you into philosophy that will make you a better person. There's interviews with me, daily lessons that will challenge you to be better, give you new ways of thinking, tackling the problems of life, becoming your best self. As Marcus Aurelius says, you could be good today, but instead you choose tomorrow. Epictetus says, how much longer are you going to wait to demand the best for yourself? Check out our new course, Stoicism 101 at dailystoic.com slash 101. One of my uh, uh, similar books, since we were talking about recommending uh, uh, books, um, I don't know if you've ever read Tolstoy's A Calendar of Wisdom, but at the end of, at the end of Tolstoy's life, Tolstoy wrote this book, A Calendar of Wisdom, that was also uh, suppressed by the communists for almost a hundred years. And so there is this kind of rich tradition of ideas or things that may otherwise have spread globally as these works of art made their way to people uh, throughout the 20th century that, uh, you know, were just sort of lost and we're only kind of rediscovering them now. This book was published in like 1989. That's when the first time it was published in English. It's kind of incredible. Uh, it was the same decade that the Secret History of the Mongols was first published in English by Oxford University. Uh, sorry, by Harvard University. But you know, I, I think our century and uh, communism do not have a monopoly on that kind of censorship. I think it's been going on for. Or I think it still goes on today in the world, and it's very unfortunate. And I think one of the paths that we as authors, I hope, feel is the constant we be looking at the underside of the story, constantly be looking at, at what else is out there. I, mean, I, I sort of envision it as, as go into the darkness, go into the darkness. That's where we have to, you know, we can't just hang around the lamppost like that, that famous anecdote of the drunk looking for the car keys who lost them yes. on one street, but looks because it's under the, the lamppost. But I think that 
many scholars, I hate to say this because I was a professor for a long time, and, but many scholars, they just look under the lamppost. They're just looking where there's already light. And they're just comparing what others have said and this has been said. And I, I really believe, no, we have to find a new way. Each time we have to find some new type of evidence. Don't just compare the same words from the past, but go out there and look for something and find it. You don't know what you're looking for, but go look for it and find it. And I think that's, that's part of our job. I see it. Yeah, and Nietzsche said that too much of philosophy is arguing over the definition of words with other words. And I think a lot of even nonfiction and narrative nonfiction, it's just treading over the same ground, saying the same story slightly differently. And I think the best books, not just for, even from an intellectual standpoint, but, but even from a sales perspective, it's like when you, yeah. when you find that blue ocean, the stuff that's not churned up by other okay. people, not only do you add something to the, the wisdom and knowledge base of humanity, but also um, you, di- you differentiate yourself and you allow, you know, like I think what was, it's not like there's, this is one of 20 great books on Genghis Khan that you can read. The irony is, uh, e- even though it's, it's, you know, it's more than a, a decade and a half old uh, and it's sold very well it's kind of still like the category, like it's the main book. And, and uh, I think that's a sign that you carved out new space or a new way of thinking about a thing. Well, you make me feel very proud. And uh, I, I, if that is true, I do hope it's a transitory moment because I think one of the things that, again, as authors that we should be doing is as you encourage other people to write, it's also to encourage other voices to come along say, okay, this is how I did it. This is my voice. I want to make it heard. But the the greatest effect I can have is if I stimulate other people to have a voice, even to say, no, 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 you're wrong. This is what I think. This is what I found out. No, I I believe in that very much. You want to start a conversation with your work, not be the end of a conversation. I agree completely. I mean, I've always phrased it slightly differently, that it's a a journey and I, I want to start the journey but it's up to the other side, to the reader, to finish the journey. They take it where they want. I don't want to tell them where to go with it. That, that's very well said. You know, there's – here, I want to actually give you this passage because uh, I used it in, in one of my books. Um, I was thinking about um, – let me find this here. I was th- when, what, what strikes me about – you know, when you think about, let's say, a Genghis uh, – sorry, when you think about a, a Napoleon – or a Julius Caesar, you kind of get this sense that they came out of the womb that way. They were just these savants or these geniuses. And what I found most striking about your portrayal of Genghis Khan is the sort of iterativeness of it, the growth of it. Um, And there's a passage that B.H. Liddell Hart uh, had. He was talking about William Tecumseh Sherman, the American general. And he said, Among men who rise to fame and leadership, two types are recognizable. Those who are born with a belief in themselves and those in whom it is a slow growth dependent on actual achievement. To the men of the last type, their own success is a constant surprise and its fruits the more delicious, yet to be tested cautiously with a haunting sense of doubt whether it is not all a dream. In that doubt lies true modesty, not the shame of insincere self-deprecation, but the modesty of moderation in the Greek sense. It is poise, not pose. And he was contrasting uh, the sort of slow burn accumulation and discovery process of William Tecumseh Sherman with a Napoleon who's just like, believes he's destined to conquer the world. Where do you see uh, Genghis fitting in in that dichotomy? Because he strikes me as more of the, the slow burn. Yes, it was a slow growth. I think that he accumulated this over time based upon his own experiences. Now, the problem with saying that is that, of course, once it's over, once these things have happened, then people look back and write it as though it was predestined. And so then we get them saying, well, he was born with a blood clot in his hand and, 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 and things such as that. And all that may have been true. I do not think that there was any sign at all among the pe- for the people around him when he was born, that he was destined for this kind of greatness. 
I don't think he saw it. I think it just grew over life as he faced one problem and overcame that. Then he faced another. You know, his wife was kidnapped, and then he had to get her back. And he got her back, and then there was a feud with that tribe. And then he had to overcome that and their allies. And then it just kept growing over his life. Yeah, it seemed like he, it, and it was mostly defined to me by his hunger to learn. He wasn't someone who was necessarily born with all of the tools or the understanding, um, but he uh, acquired them quite quickly. And he, he, he never had to be taught something twice. Yeah, well, that's a good way to say it. I, I, I think I agree with that. He had no formal education, of course. He, he had no one to teach him to read or write because there wasn't even a written language for the Mongolian language at that time. So he had, had no one to teach him in that formal sense, but he did have some uh, good people around him who influenced him, and he began to learn from them, but he had that ability that we all think we have, we all claim it, and that is to learn from our mistakes. But yes. so often... We make that mistake, and then we're just kind of determined to uh, do it again. No, it was, uh, if it hadn't rained that day, it would have worked. I'm going to do it again. No, he, he recognized over and over where he made a mistake. And I think that was, that's a power that most of us do not have. And he also had that ability to recognize the, the power of other people and where they surpassed him in something and to help channel their ability into the same mission that he had and, and people were extremely loyal to him that's a, a thing that he was able to create that helped him so it wasn't just his own knowledge but his ability to accumulate people around him with different kinds of knowledge and to put it together he was the coordinator of all that yeah there's a an epictetus quote that i love he says it's impossible to learn that which you think you already know <laughs> and yes. it strikes me as as Genghis Khan. I mean, I, I don't think anyone would say he's going around like Socrates. What do I know? I know nothing. But it did seem like if someone was better than him at something uh, or did uh, things differently but more effectively than him, almost immediately he stole that from them and, and incorporated it into what he was doing or he tried to learn and modify what he was doing based on this new information that he got, oftentimes not from his friends, but from his foes. Uh, yes, he was very quick to learn from them, uh, especially you see that in the warfare where he was able to, to start incorporating some firepower uh, from the Chinese, for example, and to use uh, siege engines and other things that you know, the Mongols had no experience with at all. And uh, even the rechanneling of rivers in order to turn the force of the river against city walls. He had so many ideas that he was able to accumulate. And I think part of it is because he had no commitment to one ideology. He had not studied one book of strategy that he then was following uh, that one book. You know, the, the, um, the way that it's taught in military school or something. No, he just had to go out there and figure it all out. Yeah, it, uh, he assumed a kind of formlessness, which is kind of how people saw the Mongol horde, this like adaptive, changing, water-like thing that was unstoppable. He would, he, he, would, he, he would take whatever would work and change how it, it was. It, he didn't have this picture of how things should go. You know, like whatever that, that uh, uh, when, you, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It feels like he was the opposite of that. I agree. I agree. He was the opposite. And when you come in, you don't already have a written language. There's nothing you can read to help guide you. You don't have one of those big world religions which is going to teach you this is the right way to do it. And this is where I think going into the darkness was helpful to me because I, you know, I was no scholar of this. I was no scholar of Asia. I've never taken a course on anything Asia, not even the art or the economy, nothing. And then there I am in Mongolia, and I'm thinking I'm going to write this book. Well, instead of just going back to all of those old manuscripts, I chose the one, the oldest one, the called, so-called secret history of the Mongols, and it was impossible to understand. I would read that thing, and uh, I mean, it's, it's like trying to read the the Bible in Hebrew or something. It was so difficult struggling through it. 
But what I decided to do was go to those places, go to those places in there. And then it immediately, I saw my perceptions were wrong. I thought of Genghis Khan as a person on the steppe, this great vast plain that's open all the way across Eurasia. That's how we see him. But I went to where he grew up, and it's the edge, it's a mountainous area on the edge of the plain, and it's all trees around there. You can't, you can't have herds of animals out there grazing. And then I looked very closely at the secret history, and I realized most of the early mentions were of hunting, not of herding. And it was about bows and arrows. I mean, you look at something like the, the Hebrew Bible, which is based upon uh, real nomadic people who are herders, and you have, you know, thy, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. You know, they're talking about things that pertain to pastoralism. Whereas in the secret history, it was all things that pertain to hunting, the bow and arrow, to the whistling arrow, uh, to, to all of these details. And then I looked at his the animals he did own. He owned some horses. But then I realized, just from reading it, they were geldings. Okay, that tells you right away he is not herding. The gelding doesn't reproduce. You don't have a mare to produce uh, offspring or milk. They are using those to hunt. Why else would you have a, a gelding except to raid or hunt? And so he grew up in that world on a mountain of hunting and doing these kind of activities that were much different than being a shepherd. And so this began, this was the beginning of going into the darkness, of seeing this place that he had actually lived and where he had done things. And then you begin to see what makes sense, in, in this case, in the secret history. I began to feel it come alive as I was there in the place. No, I, I love that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the scholar Victor Davis Hansen. Um, he, he's written a lot of, of books, uh, mostly about the Greeks. Uh, he's sort of become this strange partisan political figure now in the U.S. But I remember... Um, to go to your point about going in the darkness or seeing things firsthand and the, the conclusions that can come from that. He was talking about how, okay, let's say you read Pel the history of the Peloponnesian War and it says, you know, then the, the Spartans uh, raised the Athenian fields and, and leveled them or whatever, right? And he's like, well, how hard is it actually to like uproot an olive tree? Like he just went and tried to do it with the tools that they had. And he's like, this is impossible. He's like, so this is actually, it's probably much more performative than we thought. Or for instance, he was writing about Alexander the Great and he went and he put on one of those helmets, right? Like the, the, the helmet that the troops would wear. And then um, he, he, was, he was writing something about those battle orations, you know, the, um, the speech that the general would give to the army before the speech. And um, he realized, and this is pretty big, it's like, it doesn't have ear holes. Like the helmet doesn't have ear holes. So yeah. like it was, it, it, it would have been a set, yeah. not only is like one general can't give a speech to a hundred thousand troops, but like he couldn't, he couldn't have given a speech to any of the troops, right? Like no yeah. one could hear. Yeah. And, and, and so it's just realizing that, oh, when, sometimes when you just read stuff, uh, when, or when you just accept it from second hand, you're not really getting the full understanding of how something works. You have to actually yeah. go to the source, get to the bottom of it, which strikes me yeah. as one of Khan's strategies as well. Yes. And so many people, in, in the case that you're discussing, many people would assume, okay, Thucydides is the source. He's our mm -hmm. oldest. He's telling us the speeches. But Thucydides himself said that he could remember all these speeches correctly, that he, right. he had to give them the way he thought they should have been given. Right. And so we're already starting off with this manufactured thing. I mean, Thucydides, whether or not he ever tried on the helmet in order to see how he could hear, I don't know. But, <laughs> but these are the things we need to do. Uh, I, you know, someone once told me that the earth speaks to us through our feet. It's by being there standing in that space that you begin to feel what happened. And I think, unfortunately, scholarship in the Western world has really drifted very far from that experiential base. And uh, they've left that kind of open for journalists and for adventurers and other people. I think it's important for real scholarship that we experience what we are going to talk about. 
Well, it's so easy for it to become a refraction of a refraction of a refraction yes. In, yes. unless you go put feet on the ground, as you're saying. Like, for instance, like obviously I've written now about Marcus Aurelius and for many, many years, and I've read meditations a hundred times. I've been to some of the places that he talks about, et cetera. But it wasn't until, you know, the pandemic happens that all of the illusions and mentions he has of the plague, what was oh, yeah. then the Antonine plague, I came to understand in yeah. a different way, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, yeah. in one of my favorite passages, he says, um, you know, a plague can take your life, uh, but there's another kind of pestilence that can destroy your character. Now, reading that in twenty tw in 2010, right, your understanding of it is fundamentally different than watching people lose their mind or their character in the midst of COVID, which isn't nearly as bad as the Antonine Plague. And you go, yeah. oh, he wasn't just speaking figuratively. He was speaking about an actual process or a thing that he witnessed as a human being that is a pretty universal thing, like COVID, a plague, the, the diseases that probably traveled in Genghis Khan's time, that that affects human behavior and that diseases and people have not changed that much in the thousands of years since. Exactly. Yes, and this is how these different experiences give us a new light. Yeah. And I mean, that's like with me suddenly just realizing the importance of the bows and arrows and the hunting being mentioned. And before it was just like, yeah, okay, they're hunting, blah, blah. It, it, it was of absolutely no importance. And I began to realize, yes, that's important. Because then I saw the exact same strategies he used for hunting, he later used in warfare. So one of my other favorite parts of the book is, is some of the lessons that he gives his children specifically about pride. And what it did seem remarkable for someone who was so successful, so powerful, and so feared he see, he try, it seemed like he tried to cultivate a kind of a modesty or an intellectual humility and for the most part escaped what they call the dictator's trap right where where you are you are surrounded by sycophants you believe your own bs and uh, you end up fundamentally overreaching or uh endangering all the things you've built and done because you're no longer living on planet Earth. Yes. Uh, he prided himself, I think, in, in, in his living exactly the way his soldiers lived. He said, I eat what they eat. I wear what they wear. Uh, he sleeps in the kind of tent they sleep in. He did not have special, any kind of special life compared to this. He had, he had no palace. He did not wear silks. Uh, he did not eat other food. Everything was like this. He, he was very proud of that. But at the same time, he also recognized later in life that his children and grandchildren would not be that way. Right. That they will be. They will be clad in uh, beautiful clothes, and they will think that they deserve it, uh, just the same way that the the goat on top of the mountain thinks that he is taller than the mountain. And this was a problem, unfortunately, for him late in life. Uh, he didn't, it's one of the things he was not able to solve. And I, I think for, for many of us, we worry about those kind of things with our children and grandchildren or the future generation of the country. And, and it hasn't been solved yet. Yeah, in, in meditations, Marcus Aurelius talks about not wanting to be Caesarified, not being stained purple by the cloak of the emperor. And it does seem that he escaped it, but his son, right, what's so interesting about this period of the five good emperors is five emperors in a row don't have a male heir and they, they have to choose the heir. And so they, you know, we get five emperors in a row because they chose it. And then the second that Marcus Aurelius has a son, the yeah. Pax Romana ends and he's not able to pass on the discipline, the humility, the hunger yeah. to learn, yeah. it, it, all of that to his son. And it ends in disaster. And that's, that's something that plagued Chinggis Khan at the end of his life. That he could see in his sons that um, even though they had many, many good attributes, he could see that it wasn't sufficient. 
Do you think there's something he could have done differently, or do you think it's just like a law of history or or, or circumstances that you can't pass that on? You know, I think that when you're so busy building a life the way he was, building an empire and a life and all, you you don't have time or it just doesn't occur to you to think about that future of after you're gone. You're just thinking about life while you're here. And then as you get older, you begin to think about what's going to happen when I'm gone. And so I think that in some ways, perhaps he was not as as attentive a father as he would have wished to be later in life, that he was so busy creating an empire that he just sort of thought the sons would grow up the way he did. But in fact, they were growing up as the sons of a conqueror. And so they were enjoying a lot of life while he was still working hard. And they were in, uh, beginning to enjoy the silks a little bit. They were beginning to enjoy uh, drinking more, debauchery. They were not completely bad. I don't want to say that. But they were certainly not as good as he was. Yeah, and and obviously this is the sort of absence in all of history, but you, you I do feel like you tried to to address it in your book on on the Mongol women. It, it does feel like we see them. It's like, well, why didn't Genghis Khan do better? And then we sort of go, well, and then what was his mother doing? And what was the female situation? It it, it is it is interesting how we sort of ignore that part of the equation. But I'm not sure. Genghis Khan could have done any of it all on his own. Right, right. I, I think he, he just kind of let everybody grow up in their own way. He developed a, a much greater affection, it seems, for his daughters uh, than for his son. But uh, he still, he was very concerned about his son. He was, a very, he was still a concerned father always, especially when they went off to fight if they were wounded or something. He became terribly worried and upset about it but he did not spend the time early on teaching them. And then he realized later in life that he needed to actually be more of an active teacher rather than just an example. And he would take them out on the battlefield and show them what they had done uh, incorrectly or how they should have done it or get them to explain to him. But it's too late. These are middle-aged men. They're already set in their ways. They already have their rivalries with each other. There's too much going on. And I think in his own emotional life, he then put a lot of uh, emotional hope in, into one of his grandsons. And quite unfortunately for him, that that grandson was the first member of the royal family to ever be killed in the battle. And he was killed in uh, in, Ramiyad, in Afghanistan. And that greatly shook to his hand. It was just greatly. It's, uh, resulted in some of the worst uh, acts of revenge of his whole career because he lost this boy. Um, ha- having read a, f- a fair amount about the Spartan women, uh, I, f- I find their contributions to that warrior culture very fascinating. And perhaps the Spartan warrior culture does not exist without the backbone of the Spartan uh, wife and daughter. What did the Mongol women bring to this force, this empire? What, what was their contribution? I think if we go back to the beginning of, the, of Chinggis Khan's life, he was raised by his mother. His father was killed very early on, and uh, the mother was cast out because she was a war captive. Uh, she wasn't a legal wife who had been uh, arranged to her family. She was a war captive from uh, Chinggis Khan's father, and so she and her children were cast out to die. She raised those children. So he grew up in a household with her. There was another wife from his father who was there some of the time, those two women. And then there happened to be another woman whom I, it's really hard to identify it. So uh, she just suddenly appears, but they just call her grandmother Gwakchin. And I'm not sure who grandmother Gwakchin was, but she did have an influence on him also. And we see that. So he had three older women raising him. And he respected them throughout his life. You know, even to the end, uh, in the last scene in which his mother appears in his life, he's already a great conqueror. And she came to argue with him about his treatment of his mother. And it said, he was afraid. 
he was afraid. It's right there in the in the secret history, you know. And they they pull no bones about it. And uh, I mean, it was a great scene. She she her camp was far away, and she heard he was uh, perhaps going to demote his brother, who was her son also, and said she she hitched her white camel to a cart and she rode all night long. And she showed up at his tent the next morning and she walked in. But you can just imagine. You yeah, know, here he is, conqueror of the world. Mom shows up, and she is outraged. She's pissed. <laughs> so these were strong, strong women, and he realized he had to depend upon, just as he had to depend upon his mother for life, in a sense that very few people could ever imagine, of her digging up roots to feed them. I don't know. He had to depend upon her. That he realized also that his uh, daughters had great strength, and he depended upon them to rule many areas of his empire. So to transition uh, to the other book of yours that I uh, loved and that I wish I, someone had assigned to me in high school, I feel like it should be an assigned reading to every American in high school, um, Indian Givers. What struck me the most about that book, to go to our point about learning from everyone, is at the end of the book, and I don't think this is a spoiler, you sort of talk about this sort of dying old uh, native woman um, and you're sort of speculating, she's kind of the last of her kind, ha- not really been westernized, and you speculate about the wisdom that's dying, not just in her, but in what she represents, generations, years, millions of people like her. And the the stupidity and the self-destructiveness of the sort of Western conquering of the continent and those people and what it actually deprived us of. I, I com- Comparing and contrasting those ideas, I mean, obviously, as you talk about in the book, we got so many ideas from the people who are here, right down to the confederation of colonies. Um, but but I, there's sort of this bitter, bitter ending of it to me, which is what are all the things we could have learned that we thought we already knew or we thought we knew better and thus we did not learn from the people who had hundreds of thousands of independent, self-contained time on this, on this, uh, on this continent, learning and discovering things, and we just destroyed it. Well, you know, you present the ideas, I think, stronger and better than I did. And for me, it was sort of, it was really, I was relating a very emotional experience that sort of just shadowed what you were saying in the sense that I was there in the jungle in Bolivia. uh, And here was this elderly lady, this old woman in her hammock, uh, just very close to death. And I looked around me, and I thought, how could she live in this place? How did anybody live in this jungle? It is so hot. There are things crawling all over the ground and up your leg and on your arm. There are things eating at you. Every step you take, you're either in mud or there. uh, How did she live when I find it so hard? I am just amazed that she could do it. And... There was just something about it's wanting to ask her, of course, it was too late. You know, how did you do this? How did you do this? And knowing that I heard she had spent most of her life with no contact to the outside world at all. She was a very small band of Uruki people uh, who had no contact and, and they were, as they say, brought into contact very late in her life. And so she had little experience with uh, any of our sins. And I couldn't have talked to her about it anyway, but it was that feeling of just watching some unknown knowledge disappear. Knowledge that I could not survive in that place for three days. I knew if they left me there alone, uh, in three days I'd be gone. And yet she had lived there for, I have no idea how many years, and she didn't either, I'm sure. But yes, there's so much knowledge. And I think, you know, our, our very word civilization, etymologically coming from cities, no. 
that's not where knowledge comes from. Maybe books come from there and things like that. But the food we eat do not come from, does not come from cities. The clothes that we wear, those materials don't come out of the city. You know, our life has been shaped by people on the margins out there. People who are doing things that now we've forgotten how to do and, and where to do them. And this is, in a way, whether it's the Mongols, the Chinggis Han, those people, or whether it's this uh, tribal group in the jungle of Amazon. Or, uh, I wanted to see their place in the history of the world and their contribution to civilization, of what they have done for us. I wasn't searching for this lady at the end that she appeared to me, and then I realized there was so much more we could have possibly learned from these people that we did not learn. And then that was a kind of a, a sad moment for me too, the way you, you said. No, it's it a it's a, a tragic it's a, it's a tragic moment, and it, it's a reminder, I think, it, of the cost of conceit or the sense of superiority. Right? Um, I remember reading. Uh, uh, Jack Davis has a a history of the Gulf of Mexico. It won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. It's a great book, and he describes this scene where. French or Spanish, I, I forget, uh, these these uh, explorers come into the Gulf of Mexico for the first time and they're down, you know, they, they reach sort of the entrance to the Mississippi and they're down to their absolute last, you know, out of water, out of food, they're dying of scurvy, etc. And these native people who are strapping and tall and succeeding are eating this shellfish that they can just pick up, you know, lobsters and oysters and clams. They're just picking it right out of the ocean. And the explorers died in, instead of doing that, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they looked at that and they said, that's gross or that's obviously regress backwards or there's something wrong with it. And they, they, they literally died <laughs> instead of mm -hmm. learning uh, or trying a new way of doing things, which sadly yeah. is not a kind of hubris limited only to explorers conquering new lands. Yes, right. It's, it's, it's the point that you made before about uh, uh, if we, we're not going to search for any new information or truth if we think we already know it all. And yes. I, I, I think that's been a, well, it's a conceit of many people in many places. Uh, but it's a problem for all of us in the world uh, that we have these kind of feelings. I mean, I see it in Mongolia. I see it here in Cambodia. I've seen it in, in Bolivia, in the, in the jungles and in the mountains, that people have this knowledge that, not even necessarily knowledge that I want to know, but knowledge that if I was stuck in that place, I would need to know it. When I see how people can go out here and fish in, in Cambodia, and all the fish that they can bring in, I'm absolutely amazed. Or even in Mongolia, I remember one day, oh, it was a cold, it was 51 below zero, 51 below zero. And this 12-year-old boy went out with, a, with his iron pick and dug a hole, it must have been at least uh, two feet deep, into the ice, dropped the line in and caught a fish. And then... Oh, oh, wow, must be a lot of fish. I can do that. Well, he had already dug the hole. I didn't have to do that. And he had built a fire on top of the ice because it was so cold that it didn't melt, of course. And so I went there and sat down. I caught nothing the whole day, nothing. And then I'm, a 12-year-old boy made dinner for the whole family, and I come home with nothing but a, <laughs> well, yeah, it was cold. Um, um, you know. So... You began to see the kind of knowledge that people have in these places that they did not get out of the city or out of the university or, or out of reading our books. They have an innate, uh, it's innate to their culture, not innate, in it, but in their culture, a way of learning things. It's just amazing to me. Amazing. What, and again, the irony uh, is that the native peoples were incredibly hungry and flexible and adaptable to the technologies that the colonialists and the settlers were bringing, right? The horse wasn't here. I mean, the horse had been here for 
for evolutionarily for, for many years and then it was bringing back. That's why it thrives in the environment. But, you know, it's not like they went to, they got writing lessons, right? They, they figured out how to readapt the horse into what they're doing. And then later the rifle and, and iron as you're, like that. They, like, we were the closed minded ones. They were the ones that were adapting and changing. And, you know, obviously not all the technologies were beneficial. Some of the, the things we brought were deeply harmful and disrupted old ways of doing things. But there wasn't that impediment, the same direct uh, going the other direction. And, and uh, I, I find the irony of that fascinating. But the native people so often saved the colonists. Who yes. Not be certainly in New England, with people, the most famous case being Squanto, but the native people showing the Puritans how to grow crops and giving them food until they could do it. And, and I think probably something like that happened at Roanoke in, in North Carolina, that there's no sign of any violence, that the people probably simply could not feed themselves. They were they just absorbed into, into the... Yes, the native people. And so there was an openness to helping all of these colonists. And that's the, part of the irony of it, you know. But you, well, you take a snake to your bosom and you're going to be bit. That's, it's the that's, irony and the tragedy of it, right? Yes, yes, yes. And, and we are on the tragic side of that. Yeah. Uh, it's our a, it's loss. A... In the end, it's our loss. Their loss yes. immediately, but in the end, it's our loss. It's a whole, the whole world civilization loses from that. Well, the, you know, the Stoics talk about the idea of the common good, that we're citizens of the world, that we all have a role, we all are valuable. It, it's, it, and when you think about it that way, uh, you know, Marx really says what's bad for the hive is bad for the bee. There's a certain element of cutting off our nose to spite our face in the in the closed mindedness of it all, because yeah, ultimately we suffered, they suffered and the continent's still big enough for everyone. Right. Yeah. And so there, there is, there's a pointlessness to all of it. I, I feel. Yes. It's, a, it's part of the, the tragedy of civilization. Yeah. And what's also weird to me is like, we tend to think of these, it's like this was happening in the world and that was the only thing happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of this is kind of overlapping, right? Like uh, yeah. I forget the exact you know, beginning and end of the Mongol uh, period, but I, one of the fascinating parts uh, I, I took from the book is you're pointing out like what's happening in France. You know, France is persecuting the Jews precisely mm -hmm. as Genghis Khan is holding these religious debates, you know, inside his yeah. territories. But that, yeah. you know, a lot of these events happening in the Americas were not that far from or removed from the stuff that was happening in Europe. And when you go, oh, you know, this, you know, uh, Shakespeare is writing at the same time that these colonies are being formed in the Americas and yeah. this exchange of knowledge between the the natives and the and the settlers is happening it's like the greatest art of all time is also being created but they're also fighting bears in theaters in london you know like that yeah. we, we like to think one is so much more advanced than the other or that that it happened in these distinct phases and that's that's a historical yeah. fiction yes i remember it's odd you mentioned shakespeare so today for whatever reason i was reading Timono, um, of Athens, you know, Shakespeare's work. Uh, most people think it's just a, a worthless book or one of his, because it doesn't have all of the artistic, the, the scenes don't open correctly and the, the voices don't tell. But intellectually, I thought it was one of the most challenging things that I ever read by him because it's a, such a critique of civilization in there, in that Timon has the, uh, very rich man, and he has given away all of his wealth to help other people. And then nobody helps him when he has nothing left. And he, he retreats into the countryside, and uh, he finds gold, and then, of course, everybody comes back to him again. But he ends up giving it to Alcibiades, 
and tell it in order to help finance his conquest of Athens. It was a very interesting, I could see, I felt like Shakespeare was struggling with something there that he didn't struggle with in the other books. I mean, he has a lot of melodrama and he has a lot of romance and different things that are more emotional than deeply intellectual. And he was there at the beginning of capitalism, the beginning of the modern world, and he was seeing the effect that money had on people. I thought that was a very insightful thing. And the critique then of the civilization, and he didn't phrase it in terms uh, of, of the tribal people, but of this retreat to the countryside and living back in a cave again. Yeah, or, or uh, Montaigne, you know, he has his essay on cannibals, which is yes. about the yes. people yes. being discovered in the colonies. And it's obviously a somewhat of an offensive title, and I don't think they were actually cannibals or right. whatever, but he's... He's like, well, what do these people have to teach us? What what do they think that's different? Like, you know, and that's in the 1500s. And it's just so crazy. Again, we think about uh, maybe in America because we think Native Americans, we think settling of the West. You know, we think mid to late 1800s. We don't think the 1500s and we don't think Europe, you know, Uh, and it's it's uh, it's just interesting how long this process that you detail in the book was really going. We're not talking about a hundred years of civilizations clashing with each other. We're talking about 500 years, maybe more. Yes. Our, our images, in, I think in American society, so much of the imagery is based upon 19th century ideas yeah. of Native America. And that was the worst century of the persecution and the genocide. I use that word. That was the Industrial uh, Revolution version of it. Yes. It, it really got into the, just sort of wiping them out if possible. And that was the 19th century. Uh, even, in, even in the 18th century, the United States had been very dependent upon to help, help them fight the American Revolution, for example. Uh, right. To keep some from fighting with the, the English. There were all these issues that were very important for the uh, by the colonists in the 18th century, but by the 19th, they were no longer needed. Well, and I, I think the, what, what I was saying, I think this is a book that should be assigned in schools. I think one of the things, like, and I, I've read a lot about people reckoning, or reckoning with the history of slavery, et cetera. Like, obviously what happened was tragic. It was unjust. It was disgusting and cruel and stupid in all these different ways. But studying it and looking at it with open eyes, it's not an indictment of me, right, as a person, right? And that, like, I think when we talk about conceit or we talk about closed minded, we go, okay, yeah, these settlers were so dumb that they didn't learn these things that they could have learned from the, the, the people who are here. In some cases they did. But it's also dumb not to study what happened and to lie to yourself about what happened. Do you know what I mean? Like, like we can take for granted, right? like I don't think it's controversial to go, the, the Soviets lost out and were, were foolhardy to suppress the history of the Mongols and not study it and celebrate it and learn from it. But we do a version of that ourselves by, yeah. you know, where there's this big debate in America about what we study in schools and they don't want things to make kids uncomfortable. It's like, it yeah. should make you uncomfortable. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, yeah. but yeah. if you shy, if you if you don't go into the darkness, like you're saying, you won't discover light. And and you need it, look at the tragedy and the genocide in some cases and the awfulness of what happened, because there's yeah. something to learn from that too. And lying to yourself about it uh, certainly doesn't make and it doesn't doesn't make it not happen. It doesn't make you not better. And it doesn't prevent stuff like that from happening in the future. Yes. You know, I, I think very few people realize that in the same week that we had the emancipation of the slaves in America by Abraham Lincoln, he signed the order for the largest mass execution of Indians in American history. I didn't know Minnesota. that. Yes. Yeah, the emancipation proclamation with effect on New Year's and they hung these people in Mankato, Minnesota, the Dakota people, 
on the day after Christmas. Wow. The same week. The same week. But the mass execution of 40 some uh, Indians. But he was sending a real message. You cannot revolt against the United States during our time of civil war. We will kill you. And we did. And so this greatest achievement, well, I mean, one of the greatest achievements of our history was the emancipation of the slaves after so many uh, centuries. And yet it came at the same time of this, almost the beginning of the final effort to kill off all of the Native Americans. We need to see that in ourselves. And we are not guilty of anything that happened before us, but we are guilty if we pass it on. Yes. You know, we are guilty if we just live in ignorance, then we begin to share that guilt. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. We don't have to atone for everything that happened in the past, but at least try to learn from it so we don't do those things. We don't repeat those things. And I, you know, I see some of the things that America did with the people and then some of the things that they have done in wars in other places, even in recent times, you know, with some of the things that happened in Afghanistan and Iraq and in, uh, before that in Vietnam or here where I live in, in Cambodia now temporarily. Sure. And every week, every week, somebody has an arm blown off or a leg or they're killed by weapons left over from this time. Just this week, they dug up a thousand pound bomb out of the river. Last week, a tractor hit some unexploded ordnance and the tractor blew up and killed him. A week before that, a 12-year-old boy. This is still going on today. And I mean, I'll, I think I feel it so much because, of course, it happened in my lifetime. And also my father was a soldier, a common soldier in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Wow. He was a soldier in Vietnam. He was, by the time he got to Vietnam, he was only a cook. He could no longer fight. He was a cook. But he was feeding people who loaded these airplanes. He feed it. And I feel that. I mean, how can I blame him? And yet, these are crimes against people. Yes. You know, of, and we, in the end, my father died from Agent Orange disease. It's our own weapons, you know, killed him. And they killed people here. I go into the eastern part of Cam Cambodia now. There are no birds. There are no birds. Even after all these years with that chemical wow. spraying and all, it's a strange feeling. And we just kind of go on with life and we forget about it. And no, these things that happened with Native people in the 19th century, I, I hate to say that we still carry them on into our own modern world. No, it's it's still there. I, I gave a talk at a, at a NATO Air Force base. Uh, this would have been in January 2020. And they were sort of showing me the planes and showing me the stuff. And, and he's like, see this bomb right here? And he was like, look at this date. You know, and it said, blah, 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 you know, 1971. And he was like, this bomb was manufactured to drop over Vietnam. Yeah. And he's like, we're still, he's like, this is still in the arsenal. We haven't, this is, this is a, this is a, almost a 50 year old bomb. And you go, wow, how big did they think this was going to go? How much longer did they think this was going on? We still have leftover munitions. Now, put aside the ones we dropped that haven't exploded, but like, they still exist. Like they're still, maybe they drop, they, they should, they would have dropped some over Afghanistan or Iraq and realizing yeah. like, it's like yeah. what Faulkner said that the past is, is not only uh, not dead, it's not even past. It's uh, still with us. Yeah. It's still there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. to stick your head in the sand about it and ignore it, it, it deprives you of knowledge. It also, in some ways, it does make you complicit. It does make yeah. you, uh, because it, you're you're allowing it to continue as opposed to facing it and studying it and learn from it. Yes. And I'm not a pacifist and I'm not, I realize there's probably going to be war as long as there's going to be humans. And all, but still, we have to learn how to be somewhat just with what we do. 
as just as we can. That should be a goal in our mind, not just to kill people, but to, to somehow bring some justice to the situation. And I, I, I just sometimes, I don't know what to feel here in a place like Cambodia. What to feel about what my country did, and I still love my country. I love my father. You know, I mean, he's now long dead, but it, it just it doesn't fit together. You know, it doesn't fit together. But we need to be aware of the bad that happened. Well, it's a very Western... Me. It's a very Western idea that it should fit together, that it should be clean yeah. and logical, and and perhaps we can learn from some. We can learn to to handle the ambiguity and the uncertainty and the moral complexity that is the human experience. Yes, and, and that's why, in, in some ways, uh, either some of the Buddhist ideas or Stoicism that these begin to give us some notion. Not that we're going to have a perfect world, but how to try to live in this world if it is in the best way that we can. And, and I think that, in a way, should be our goal. Not to make it a, a perfect world, and not to aim for something that's not possible, but to try to do the best that we can in the world that we're in. That's, that's perfectly said and uh, the perfect place to stop. Uh, thank you seriously so much. I'm a huge fan of your work. I sell both your books in my bookstore and uh, they've influenced me. They've shaped my writing and uh, enlivened and widened my perspective. And I appreciate it so much. Well, I wish I could be as productive as you are, Ryan. I am just amazed at what you have produced. But uh, I thank you. And uh, I enjoyed talking with you. And I wish you all success with encouraging people to read and encouraging people to think and to write.